I call the trading in trading places a reverse insider trading short squeeze. That's a mouthful, reverse, because instead of insider information, we have inside disinformation. Oh, hey, 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 oh, hey, 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 oh, hey, hey, hey. And instead of a short squeeze, we have a speculative bubble that collapses when legitimate information is released to the market. After calculating the estimates from various orange producing states. In this video, I'll explain commodities trading, the scam at the end of trading places margin loans, and the dangers of a sure thing and greed on Wall Street. So here's the setup. The Duke brothers, Randolph and Mortimer, are commodities brokers. Commodities are agricultural products. Coffee that you had for breakfast, wheat, which is used to make bread, pork bellies, which is used to make bacon. Just like real estate brokers or stock brokers, they earn a commission by matching buyers and sellers. Well, what do you think, Valentine? It sounds to me like you guys are a couple of bookies. Clients can buy and sell options, contracts for immediate delivery, and contracts for future delivery. A contract for a future delivery allows people to set a price now for the delivery of some commodity in the future, hence the name a futures contract. Futures are used to reduce risk for a business. Imagine if you ran an airline and you bought lots of futures contracts for fuel last year. If you did that, you'd be in great shape because you'd have fuel now at last year's prices, which are much lower than this year's prices because of the war in Ukraine, which has raised the price of energy around the world. Changes in supply and demand influence futures prices. For heating oil, it's oil supply and winter weather. For orange juice, since demand is fairly constant, it's the supply of oranges. The changing supply of oranges drives prices, and the best place to get information on the supply of oranges is the U.S. Department of Agriculture's citrus production forecast. Ladies and gentlemen, the orange crop estimates for the next year. Which is released every year at noon on a specific day in January. This year, it's on January 12th. In the movie, it was on January 2nd. So here's the scam. Although the Dukes are commodities brokers, they're also greedy speculators who have paid someone off to get an early copy of the upcoming citrus production report. And the Duke's early copy showed a shortage which will drive prices up. So the Dukes tell their trader, their pit trader, to buy at the open and to keep buying. We want you to buy as much OJ as you can. The instant trading starts. Don't worry if the price starts going up, just keep buying. But gentlemen, they're gonna broadcast the crop report in an hour. What if they're- Let us worry about that, Wilson. This is an obvious mistake because it sets off a huge increase in the price of orange juice futures. Hey, hey, the Dukes are trying to corner the market. They know something. I can feel it. Let's get in on it. That is momentum investing. People buy because others are buying. This drives the price up, which attracts more people to buy and drives the price up more, and so on and so on and so on. Rising prices are a signal that something is going on. And this happens all the time. Investors love buying stocks that have risen. And this also happened because the Dukes are known to be smart investors. They are the lead steers. And if they're buying, a herd of less informed cattle, less informed investors will buy after them. And it's those people who are bidding up the price in the market. And as you can see in the movie, the price goes from $1.02 a pound to $1.42 a pound. If the Dukes had been more discreet and had spread their buy orders around to a few other traders, maybe this wouldn't have happened, which would have been much more profitable for the Dukes. But they didn't and prices rose. Be careful when you see this in the market. When prices rise, they can also fall. And that's what we see here. Sell 30 April at 142. Sell 30 April at 142. That means that he's willing to sell 30 orange juice futures for April delivery at $1.42 per pound. Each contract represents 15,000 pounds of frozen orange juice. So 30 contracts is 450,000 pounds of frozen juice and Lewis sold them at $1.42. That's $639,000 he just sold short. Lewis didn't own any juice. So he sold his 30 contracts short. It's January 2nd and he's promising to deliver orange juice in April. So he has plenty of time to buy oranges and to deliver on his short contract. He expects to buy the juice for less so in the future so he can deliver and make a profit. This is a classic short strategy. Sell high and wait for the price to drop to buy so that you can close the contract, 
deliver on your obligation and make a profit. Short sellers are betting that prices will be lower in the future. Lewis and Billy Ray sell so much juice that prices do start to drop. How can the price be going down? Something's wrong. That's when Randolph and Mortimer Duke get nervous. Who is selling? What do they know that I don't know? They rush to the floor and see Billy Ray and Lewis and know they have a problem. At that moment, everyone stops and listens as the Secretary of Agriculture reads the citrus production forecast. The cold winter has apparently not affected the orange harvest. Surprise! There's no shortage. Randolph and Mortimer's sure thing wasn't. They were wrong. Shouldn't you come in and everything, you asshole? I gotta get Wilson and tell him to sell! There had been a momentum-driven speculative bubble predicting a shortage of juice, but instead there's plenty and prices are going to fall. Everyone who's buying, thinking the price would rise, now wants to sell, knowing it's going to fall. Prices fall below the original opening level because people must have known that there was some risk of shortage. There had been a terrible storm, which is why the price was at $1.02 to open. But now the supply concerns have been addressed and the price is gonna to fall to a more normal level. I think trading places may have oversimplified this part a bit. April is still months away, there could be another storm, but the movie's almost over and they gotta wrap this up. So prices crashed. They went from $1.02 to $1.42, way down to 29 cents. Oh, that's what you get for being a good So let's look again at that first trade that Lewis made for 30 contracts. If he sold at 29 cents and bought at $1.42, he made $1.13 a pound. And remember, that's 30 contracts for 15,000 pounds each. That's a profit of $439,000 on that one contract alone. Now let's imagine if Billy Ray and Lewis had been able to make 50 similar sales, which would have been difficult given their very limited capital, even with leverage. But if they had, they would have cleared about $23,175,000. That's over $65 million today adjusted for inflation. Now, Lewis and Billy Ray really were very lucky. They had nothing to do with the speculative bubble in orange juice, except for giving Randolph and Mortimer bad information. And because they had good information, they knew that they were gonna profit when the USDA report became public and prices collapsed. So they sold high and bought low. Unlike Mortimer and Randolph, who bought high and sold low and are ruined. They thought they knew for sure that a shortage was coming to raise prices, but they were wrong and prices fell. Margin call, gentlemen. Well, you can't expect us you to- You know the rules of the exchange, Mr. Duke. All accounts to be settled at the end of the day's trading. Because they thought they had a sure thing, their greed really got the best of them. They bought on margin, meaning they took out a loan secured by the value of their other assets. When the value of those assets fell, their margin loan was called and they had to repay immediately. You know perfectly well we don't have $394 million in cash. I'm sorry, boys. Put the uh, Duke Brothers seats on the exchange up for sale at once. Seize all assets of Duke and Duke Commodities Brokers. They said they lost $394 million, which would be over a billion dollars today adjusted for inflation. As they say on Wall Street, the only sure things are death and taxes. So could this happen now? Well, not exactly. First of all, price swings like those in the movie can't happen. Now there are circuit breakers in commodities which stop trading if prices change by more than 10 cents per pound from the prior day in any given day. Also, open outcry pit trading is no longer practiced. Now computers handle all the trading, and I think that may make it harder to see who's buying and who is selling. But what was most surprising to me is that this scam wasn't illegal at the time. Trading on non-public government information wasn't illegal until the 2010 Dodd-Frank Banking Reform Act, which many people say was inspired by the movie. In fact, section 746 of the act, which outlaws trading using non-public government information is now popularly known as the Eddie Murphy rule. But the real lesson for investors from trading places, in my opinion, is to beware of a sure thing and to beware of greed. The Dukes were incredibly rich. They didn't need to gamble what they had and needed for what they didn't have and didn't need, but they did. And this happens all the time. Most recently, probably to Bill Wang, who lost $20 billion in two days trying to get to $50 billion. I talk about him in a video of mine on the psychology of money, which is a great book. Bye-bye.